I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and letting a photo shoot exclusively with LEDs to find the pros and cons and to see if they can replace strobes altogether for both my stills and motion shoots. Today's video is about adapting to changes in the photography industry. Doesn't matter what you shoot. I picked a topic that's quite general and applies to every photographer out there. Whether you shoot fashion, weddings, portraiture, uh, high-end commercial and advertising, it doesn't matter. And the change that I've noticed over the past few years is that clients are requiring more quantity at the same more or less quality for less money. So we need to find ways as photographers to adapt to this change. And hopefully through today's exercise, we'll find a way. Is it possible to shoot a photo shoot with LED lighting and at the same time not having to change any of that lighting for video work that's embedded in that job? So that's what I'm going to try to figure out today. So what do we have to work with? We have two lights. Uh, one is a Nanlite 300B, which is a bicolor light. We have an Aperture Amaran 150C, which is an RGB light. And we have two of these pocket LEDs. This one is a bicolor, and this one is an RGB. We have four hours to do this, split into two, so two two-hour sessions, one for daylight, one for evening, and that's it. I didn't want to make anything too fancy, it's something that uh, pretty much anyone can do. Let's see how it goes. So we're shooting with a GFX, so, sorry, it's an X-H2. And uh, this is the first scene right here. So we have a 300B as a fill light. We're using the sun as the key light. Thank God the sun came out today because uh, if not, this will be the sun. And uh, this is the backdrop that we're shooting against. Um, tethered to a MacBook Pro, uh, shooting on Capture One. And I'm gonna handhold all of this just um, to get things going. So we're finished with the daytime stuff and now we're switching over to nighttime and we're resetting all the lights. So starting with this light here, it's an RGB LED and we have a barn door on it to focus the light to hit this cardboard uh, cutout uh, that uh, has a slit in it. And what that does is if you come over here, uh, it creates a very nice uh, hard edge blue light on her face. We have a uh, orange, uh, kind of a kicker in the backside to light this side of her. And then we also have another light here bouncing off the ceiling and it's at 1%. So it's very, very low. And that just gives a little bit of a fill. I can turn it up to show, show you, but um, it's hardly doing anything right now. And we're gonna start shooting. So, done our last shot, and now we're going to wrap up and leave, and I'll see you over in post-production. Okay. Oh, punk. How was it? All right? Yeah, great. <laughs> let me see. Okay, so let me start with a brain dump and unload my thoughts about shooting with LEDs. Do they really save time and keep quality? Yeah, I think it totally works, with only a few lessons learned. Number one, they're not quite bright enough. 
Even though we were indoors, we had plenty of direct sunlight shining through the windows. Well, the 300 watt light was barely bright enough, even though as a fill while shining through a diffuser at maximum output. Of course, there are more powerful lights out there up to 2400 watts, but they're much more expensive, heavier, bulkier, and therefore demands a larger crew to make them work. So I think 600 watts is the ideal balance of cost versus practicality. The second lesson is the lack of being able to adjust the ambient exposure independently from these lights like I can do with strobes. The only way to do this is to use even brighter LEDs and expose for them to darken the ambient light. Now, if it's an outdoor shoot, you're just better off with strobes just to match and exceed the daylight. Again, big LEDs do exist, but not practical unless the job is equally big. So apart from these limitations, everything else is great. I love being able to see the light with my own eyes, which really helps speed up the work. I felt myself shooting a lot faster with less time tinkering with the lighting. By the time I took my first frame for each scene, the lighting was already 90% there because I can literally see it while I was setting it up without the camera. And this speed is reflected in the final yield of about 500 frames during our four hour shoot, resulting in about 13 different photos plus three to four short video clips. I think this is pretty efficient, especially considering the added time to film me talking to the camera for this video. Another big bonus is the seamless switching between photo to video. It was downright easy. No need to bring separate lights for photo and video, which means no need to change from flash to continuous lights. Actually, no need to even touch the LEDs at all. Just confirm your video settings and hit the record button. Moving forward, I definitely have more confidence lighting with LEDs for future shoots. Now that I know about the pros and the cons, so I know what shoots can get away with LEDs and what shoots need strobes. 600 watt LEDs would be great for any indoor shoot with mostly static poses, with or without any video requirement. Even though I have two decades worth of experience lighting with strobes, I still feel LEDs are a faster way to work. Okay, lighting talk is done. Now let's talk about the camera. And thanks to Fujifilm for lending me the X-H2. You know, I started this channel because I didn't really think photography was accurately represented on YouTube, with a really heavy bias towards equipment reviews, which contradicts my belief that equipment only comprises a small portion of the craft. Yet when it comes time for me to research some new gear, I always find these YouTube reviews highly informative and helpful. So I say, may these reviewers continue making great in-demand reviews, but I need to talk about the other missing parts of photography, topics I feel more qualified to discuss due to my experience. So this is the extent of how I review cameras. I picked the HH2 for its hybrid high megapixel photography and its video capabilities, which when combined makes an ideal camera for a shoot like this one. Having shot digital since it started, I can confidently say that the more megapixels, the better for photographers. Some may say the SH2's 40 megapixels is overkill. And the most common rebuttal to that is that you have more freedom for cropping, but that's not the only reason. From a previous shoot using a phase one 150 megapixel camera, I found great results oversampling the 150 megapixels to 50 megapixels to reduce noise organically at 2000 ISO, resulting in noise so small it requires little to no noise reduction, which yields higher quality. Same deal for this shoot. During the evening portion, which was shot at around 1600 to 2000 ISO, when you down res the image to 20 megapixels, you can see much finer noise, which requires less noise reduction, if any. So it would have been a very different story if I shot at a lower ISO because I would have needed a lot more fill light to bring up the dark parts of the image. At high ISO, I can let the hanging light bulbs do all the work for me and speed up the shooting overall. And of course, I saved it all for last a photo and video set that could represent a typical editorial or small commercial job, all shot in less than a typical shoot day. A big thank you to my team for helping put this together and to you for watching. See you again soon.